Hi, can you hear me? All right. Uh, not too loud, good. Hi, so sorry for the little delay. We're uh, scrambling. We're going to show you an um, impromptu, uh, real-time version of the open world demo. We're going to have a movie for you, but we're going to do that better and do an interactive uh, uh, version since not many of you have seen the open world demo yet. Uh, Tim didn't even get a, a chance to show that during his talk, so you'll get that first view here. Um, so my name is Francois Antoine. I'm a senior FX artist. On this project, I took on the role of the asset supervisor. And then this is James Golding here, who's the lead uh, gameplay programmer. And then we have Chris Evans, who's the character technical director, senior character technical director. All right, so we're going to jump right into the video so you can see what it looks like before we start talking about it. So this is our open world terrain. It's 100 square miles. Um, without loading, it's all right there. You can see the horizon. If you can see it, you can walk there. There's no matte paintings. Um, there's no cheats. It's all geometry. Uh, we have AI that reacts to the player in there that can live. So we wanted to make sure that stuff was alive in our world. It wasn't dead. So this deer is just an example of what we could do. Um, the world is entirely uh, lit with dynamic lighting. So we have dynamic GI for open world. Uh, we can have there four time a day, nothing's baked in. Uh, and we have trees and we have you know, rocks, vegetation all over the place. We have a quite good density of grass. Um, we have some new rendering technologies that we'll touch upon, such as uh, distant field ambient occlusion, which is a medium scale um, ambient occlusion. And so we get a good, good amount of detail. You could go all the way back there to the horizon, no problem. So just to give you an idea, this is about 10 times bigger than a Skyrim uh, level. Okay, so I'm going to actually go through the little cinematic video we have as well. This is what we had planned on showing you in the first place. So uh, all the vegetation is uh, laid out procedurally using rules. Uh, we have the ability, though, to paint some uh, golden path areas. So if you have you know, an event happening in a place, you could actually custom paint that area and dress it up uh, just the way you'd want it. You can see the massive amount of uh, trees that we can support, all uh, with ray traced shadows. These are some of our photo scanned rocks. And it's pretty cool. You can actually, uh, the deer is, uh, lives in places where it should, you know, they kind of gather up in areas where they need to gather. And you can kind of hunt around the world and find where they are and scare them off. Uh, you'll be able, to, by the way, to uh, fly through this world in our booth. Uh, you can be in drone mode because it's a very large terrain, so you can navigate a bit more quickly, or in walk mode. So I encourage you to come by the booth and test it out and try to see if you can find the deer hiding around. Okay, so these are the topics we're going to hit up during the talk. Um, we're going to start with the asset creation pipeline. Um, so 
The approach we decided to take for this is uh, use a lot of photography uh, to try, since we have a, a biome that's a, uh, an existing biome, um, we thought we'd just go out and shoot, you know, why not just get reality since we're trying to get as real as we could. So we themed this for the uh, Isle of Skye in Scotland. Uh, we really enjoyed like the contrast between the green grass and the, uh, the craggy rocks and so we thought that'd be uh, kind of a neat environment to play in. So, uh, you know, like I said, um, Photography was going to be something we wanted to try for a long time, kind of expand our pipeline on the photogrammetry side, and try to start with assets that are real as possible, and then that could be kind of a baseline for uh, how far we have to bring our rendering capabilities. Um, so I want to talk a bit about our process. And um, so in order to find a location, since we have to go out in the field and shoot, we need to do some scouting. So typically with scouting, you'll have someone who'll go ahead of time and try to find cool location and then sends you pictures and then you have to go again and shoot, and it's a pretty expensive process. So since we did this in a pretty reduced timeline and we're trying to do it more efficiently, we did some what's called virtual scouting. Uh, we used Google Earth and all these very uh, kind of commonly available tools to try to find some pretty neat locations in Scotland and around the Isle of Skye, like which parts of the Isle of Skye are we actually gonna travel to to capture these assets. So once we found the asset location, um, we try to find a 360 panorama image of that location and we start breaking down the components of what make that location the way it is. Um, and so usually we'll, we'll break down things into you know, cliff faces and different components and group them together. And then we get kind of a tally of, okay, if we want to create this area of Scotland, we'll need you know, 12 different types of rocks and some are black and you know, lava-like and others are, have a sheen and patina to them. Some are eroded into the ground and we'll need these kinds of trees and vegetation. So once we get a good idea of that, um, then we're ready to go shoot. So, of course, <laughs> when we're doing this was in December, and you can imagine December in Scotland is not the best time to go shoot photography. Uh, this beer, <laughs> there's about five or six hours of daylight and it's raining most of the time. So, uh, so we decide to go to New Zealand. It's on the other side of the equator. Uh, it's got quite a nice variety of different landscapes. So. Um, we sent a team of two people there. There's 12 hours of daylight, so it was perfect. It was the summer. The vegetation was in full bloom. It was very green and lush, and this, that's the look we actually wanted. So a team went there, and then we had a team from Epic Games UK working out of uh, Sunderland uh, and capturing local things. When there was the occasional nice day out, they'd go out and shoot some uh, assets in the UK um, to kind of inject that authentic feel of you know, rocks and vegetation in the UK. So in the end, it wasn't quite Isle of Skye. It was what we call School Zealand. Well, you know, we tried, but uh, this is as close as we could get. So during the uh, reference photography, uh, during photography, we had two kinds of ways we wanted to uh, uh, use our photography. There was reference photography, which means we were taking pictures of plants, flowers, and bushes, things that were not very conducive to be reconstructed in 3D. And then we had the photogrammetry aspect, uh, which was about, you know, recreating 3D meshes, uh, 2D ground tiles, which actually were 3D. We just convert them to a 2D tile, and as well tree bark that we use for all our trees. So let's talk a bit about the reference photography process. It's a pretty straightforward process. You know, we, uh, so it was done in the field. We'd go to a location, do photogrammetry, and then we'd look at the vegetation there and the landscapes, and we'll take some reference pictures. Um, so you know, uh, we'd have like a chroma key backer board, basically, so that the artist could chroma key the uh, vegetation out. Uh, don't use a green one. It'll cause you, <laughs> it'll cause you problems. <laughs> Um, so we use a circular polarizer to try to remove some of the specular reflections when we're photographing uh, leaves and, and those kind of more shiny surfaces. Uh, the color checker is important for color calibration. And then the kind of very tricky part when you're taking pictures so close to vegetation is maintaining a, uh, a good depth of field because in general it'll be pretty shallow. So that means you'll get the front tip of the leaf in focus and the back blurry and that doesn't really help for textures. So. And then finally we should bracket it just to cover ourselves. So these are some of the sample uh, photography that we brought back, some landscape you know, photography, so the artist can look back at how, how were these assets laid out, because that's a big part of making something look pretty real, is not only having the assets and plunking them down, but they have to be laid out in a way that nature would probably do. Uh, and then at the bottom you see some kind of uh, vegetation. We use the, the little grass patch there on the right uh, quite a bit in the demo. So these are, this is a very small sample of some of the vegeta vegetation we uh, assets we actually created using uh, reference photography in the demo. We've got a very big bunch of them. Some little buttercups and some pretty awesome looking trees.
All right, so let's talk a little bit about the photogrammetry. So for those of you not familiar with photogrammetry, uh, it's the process of recreating a 3D mesh using a series of pictures. Uh, on the right there is an example of a tree trunk that was reconstructed using photogrammetry. Um, so it's a bit more involved. Our process has a kind of a custom uh, bespoke aspect to it, so we had a, needed a bit more gear than uh, most people shooting photogrammetry would need. Um, there was two of us going, so this is for the shoot in New Zealand, there was two of us going there, so we used a bunch of Canon full frames cameras because we had to do panoramic images and we want to make sure we get the full fish eye. Um, we used a remote live view, which means we can put the camera on top of a very tall pole. And we're able to capture, like for example, a rock face uh, patch really up high. If you shoot from down up, you'll get some projection distortion, so you want to avoid that kind of stuff. And then for the panoramas, we used a motorized uh, panoramic head um, because we could control uh, manually, the, uh, automatically, the bracketing of the image. We used custom bracketing uh, for a reason I'll talk about a bit later. So our shoot process, when we found the asset that we want to capture, uh, this is in, uh, in, uh, in, in New Zealand, um, we do start with a reference picture because when you do photometry, a lot of times you're taking close-up pictures of the, the asset and you're not seeing the whole view. So this is kind of a reference of what does it look like in its setting and how does it integrate. And then uh, we take a, a chrome ball and a, a gray ball version. I, I build this little rig myself. Uh, the reason for that is that we want to capture the light direction intensity of the asset when we shoot it. And then we have a color chart as well. This is our uh, panoramic rig. So to, for every asset that we captured, we shot a 360 degree uh, HDR panorama which captures the full range of the lighting. What we're doing here is effectively capturing the intensity of the sun so that we could use that later on during the processing of our assets. And then we go through the actual photogrammetry shoot, which is actually you know, capturing the asset from uh, all angles. Now there's a lot of intricacies with this process. You have to make sure that uh, you're capturing in light and in, in detail in the shadow as well. So you gotta expose using the histogram really carefully and all that. But if you do that, uh, then you'll pull it off. So after seven days, we captured nearly 30,000 pictures. Uh, quite a few assets, 250 assets. We traveled a huge amount of uh, miles by car because we went to all the different parks and all that. Uh, so for reconstruction, it was a pretty big task. We're not, we did not process all these assets. We processed only about 50 of them for the demo. So we got still a lot more coming that we're gonna keep processing in our, uh, in our time. Uh, so we worked with Epic Games UK, Poland, and Kerry. So this was a big challenge because the um, working file format for these raw images is between five and 10 times bigger than the, the raw version. So that means like per asset, we'd have to transfer between sites between seven and 50 gigabytes of pictures per asset, which is huge over the internet. Um, and not only that, there was a problem. So we'd say, I'm uploading it now, and then in Poland, they start to see images of pop, pop up. They wouldn't know when the process was finished. They, well, there are 300 pictures, 250, so it was a kind of a burden. So we had to come up with a new pipeline, a new process, how to um, kind of alleviate this massive bandwidth issues that we had between international sites. So we came up with this thing which is called the GDC Asset Photo Ripper. It's a little uh, Python uh, script. Um, it's got some kind of deep things in there in terms of image processing. But the bottom line is that we only uploaded the raw images and it handled creating local working directories on all the artists' workstations so that uh, all the processing and all the copying from the network was done in a, a multi-thread environment. So we do many uh, using FX copy, many copies, and then we do all the processing multi-thread using like 32 or 40 cores that the artist workstations have to process all the images uh, into the working file format, which in our case is a TIFF 16. So that was kind of like a little pipeline work we had to do to get things going. Um, and now that I mentioned TIFF 16s, uh, we're, our process was entirely in linear uh, color space. Uh, we want to make sure we avoided any kind of sRGB tone mapping. Uh, so TIFF 16s give you that kind of black image, that's a linear image. Uh, it's not very artist friendly and it's hard to paint if you had to paint a texture this way. I mean, you don't even see what you're doing. So we have a custom version of T16 that Epic wrote uh, that applies a baked in sRGB lookup and that can get removed later on and there's no loss of information or dynamic range. So uh, that was a pretty cool kind of custom thing. So once we feed all the, inf the, uh, the images into the photo scan, so we're using Agisoft photo scan for reconstruction. It's a pretty well established piece of software. Uh, so this is the mesh and then the textured mesh on the right that we're seeing there. So we're getting a pretty good amount of detail. Um, the, the high poly we're getting is usually in up to 20 million polys and we dump out 16K textures to make sure that we get the full uh, resolution. Our, each picture is about 5,700 pixels wide. Um, so con considering that covering maybe the front face, so that will probably take about 10 pictures wide, so you can see we have definitely a lot of resolution there. 
So this is when we look at the asset, we see there's a lot of issues with lighting. There's baked in lighting all over it. You know, you, can, you have the lighting uh, on top over there. This is the direct lighting. You have bounce lighting over here and you have shadows all over the place. And this is shot on a pretty overcast day. So how are we gonna put this in a, in a game engine where you have to be able to light from any angle that you want? Um, if you put a, 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 the sunlight just hitting straight here, or, or, or if you're exploring with a spotlight, or a, uh, you, you're still gonna have shadows and it's gonna look terrible. So we have this kind of a, another custom uh, script that we, and the pipeline that we came up with was like, since we captured lighting when we shot the asset, we know what the lighting is, so let's recreate it. And this is what you're seeing, a semi-automated process here in Maya that recreates the lighting with the object. Um, so we're mimicking the lighting on the set and we're baking out a, uh, what we call a de-lighting texture on the right there. So we'll take that and then we'll process it with um, the actual source texture and you can see the before and after. See all the micro shadowing, even very fine detail. When it's properly calibrated, we're able to remove it and get the diffuse albedo. If you look at the top of the rocks, you can see the shading because that was a uh, rock face that was getting more light and that's completely gone out of there. So this is uh, a little custom process. We ran through all our assets so that they can be lit in any environment. And I think that's a big thing that's missing for most of the other um, photogrammetry attempts. So this is still a process that we're evolving some more. Um, so this is called the diffuse albedo. So we get the diffuse albedo out of there. This is what the delit uh, object looks like. This is the base color. And then we, we also create then the roughness and specular map because we have to take full advantage of our uh, uh, UE4 PBR rendering. So those are needed to get proper rendering and how rough and how much light is reflected by the rock. So once that's done, uh, we have the high poly asset. Now we need to make a game ready asset. So in the future, this is a step that we'd like to uh, eliminate and we're definitely working on some tech there. Uh, in a way we could potentially bring in like the high poly of everything and then the engine would take care of all the rest. But for now it's still a manual process. Um, so we do a version that's capped of the rock if it's needed so that the artist can place it in any direction they want so there's some ZBrushing involved. But otherwise it's just doing the regular LODs and some texture cleanup is, if needed. So we had you know, that kind of big uh, quantity of assets and we need to go through it and kind of zoom in and look at, you know, how's the texture looking? Are there any other facts, et cetera, from the reconstruction? So, because um, UE4 has this awesome blueprint scripting engine, um, I built an asset uh, turntable, which allows us to view the assets from all angles. So I just click through a quick demo of this. So it uses the calibrated lights uh, that were captured either in a level or in the real world. And it has its own, it's basically its own game, uh, but it has like really controls just to view things, the different uh, frame buffers, basically roughness, specular, what I call AOVs, normals. You can change the uh, LODs to view them for debugging. You can change lighting scenarios and make sure the object reacts with lighting in different lighting environments. So all these are part of the process of getting these assets approved because they can't just work in one lighting environment. They have to work in pretty much all the lighting environments. That's what makes them physically real. So these are some examples, a small selection of assets that uh, we pumped out through this demo. It's only about, I'd say, a third of what we went through. Um, just showing them for demo. This is a, a pretty cool spire from the UK. So different rocks. This rock is used all over the place because people like the moss. Rocks, rocks, rocks. And the lava rock. They made the, the video is a bit dark, so I apologize for that. I've seen that one before. We also had like things like scree piles like this that were used pretty thoroughly. Um, a lava flow. Some cool cliff faces. Those are also used extensively throughout the open world demo. Showing a bit the kind of detail we can get out of this, the reconstruction. And by the way, we're looking at the low polys. These are not the high polys. So we, these are the ground tiles. So these are all, this is all game assets, yeah, I should be clear about that. These are like, a, they max out, I guess, the poly count is about uh, 30,000 polys for the big clay, cliff faces. They go down to about five or, or 7,000 polys for the rocks. And then we do LODs on top of it. So these are used for our terrain material. These are actually 3D meshes, and then we bake them into 2D with normals, but we have displacement maps for them, so when we're ready to do tessellation, we can definitely bring them back out in 3D again. So this is the asset team. I wanted to give them a big round of applause because uh, those guys had to come up with... Uh...
Thank you. They're going to be thrilled. They worked like crazy over the past month and a half adopting this new pipeline, which was not a very obvious process. It came in really hot. So cool. So let's jump in into about uh, the lighting improvements we had to do for the open world demo. So uh, the big thing is that we have fully dynamic lightings for uh, huge open worlds, uh, which means we can have time of day, which means we can have uh, amazing shadowing and lighting even really far, 100 miles away, you could still see the proper shadowing and, and lighting. And we have GI, which is for open world, which is pretty amazing. Um, so these are the lighting components we had to solve for uh, during the demo. Uh, so there's three of them, and we're going to go through them and how we kind of solve those issues or the approaches that we took. So this is traditional uh, cascade, uh, cascaded shadow maps, how we do shadows in most natural games. Uh, normal games, you can see that you're not getting shadows up front. You're only getting like a, a, a shadows to the trees that are very close by. And then also you have resolution issues and massive amounts of memory used. So they're very costly. And, uh, and you can see what our ray traced um, shadow maps, uh, our ray traced like uh, sign distant fields give us. So a lot of detail. And I can do it back and forth, you can see the difference. Uh, it's pretty obvious, it's amazing. So uh, what is a, uh, a distance field? So it's basically a representation of the scene that stores the distance um, at every uh, mesh uh, point. So it's basically kind of like a different representation. So here's the mesh distance field representation of our scene and the polygon uh, representation. So what this does, it allows us to ray trace actually much more efficiently. And so on the bottom right there, you see that we're, can, we're able to do a, a ray cast um, to see if an area is in shadow with only three steps as opposed to potentially doing like a lot of fixed steps intervals. So it allows us to do this kind of ray trace shadowing in the distance. Uh, and also as well, for free, when we do the ray trace, we're able to uh, do cone intersections which allow us to do area shadows. And that's another big plus. So moving on to the bounce for the sunlight. So light bounces. Um, and so we had to come up with a technique. So this works for height field terrain. What happens is that we compute lighting for the terrain, uh, and then when we light uh, and we shade any of the trees, then we're gathering up um, the light from the terrain, and that mimics bounce. You can see on the right there, you have bounce on the rock as well as the base of the tree trunk. So pretty amazing. It made a big difference in the demo. Uh, for the cube maps, uh, we pre-process them for the different roughness levels. Um, so that's our trick there. And then finally, we have to shadow the sky lighting, right? So uh, on the left, you have the SSAO, which is pretty much the industry standard for doing uh, ambient occlusion. But it's pretty small scale. And it's usually a d kind of a detail ambient occlusion. And so uh, we, uh, we implemented what's called distance field ambient occlusion, which uses the same volume, uh, voxelized representation, basically, of the scene. And you can see we're getting basically mid-sized uh, ambient occlusion, which is basically awesome for tree level and kind of big rocks. Um, and the way it works is that basically for uh, a point that needs to be shadowed or um, on the surface, we're doing cone traces and looking at uh, what's obstructing the cone trace. And then we're determining it, uh, how dark it should be. So that's kind of our approach. The other great thing is that it's not a screen space tech. So that means it can work with objects that are off screen, which is a, a, a big plus. And there's no artifacting. So that's it for the lighting. Now we're jumping through shading and post. Some improvements there as well. And these apply to not just uh, you know, open world demo, this applies to all our tech. So the big one is like having a transmission of light through thin objects. So this works for uh, leaves, but also for thin paper and thin objects. And basically what it does is that you can, if you look at the backside of a, a, a leaf that's lit, normally you'll get a dark backside because light doesn't transmit through it. And people in the past have been using subsurface scattering to kind of fake that, but that's not accurate and doesn't give you the proper result. So now if you look through the back using this uh, technique through the back of the leaf, you'll actually get light transmitting and it'll light the back of the leaf as well. So this was a big improvement for the look of our trees and vegetation. And we also applied it to our kite as well. Uh, we have improved subsurface scattering. Now we have diffusion profiles, which allows uh, the user to determine um, how the light behaves once it hits uh, the object. How does it scatter inside the skin? So it works for skin, but it's not uh, made for skin because the different diffusion profiles, you can just make it apply to anything that you want that needs subsurface scattering. And we have, thank goodness, a much more impressive motion blur. This is a completely new motion blur algorithm. Uh, we don't have outlines on motion blur anymore, um, which are a limitation of a lot of the game engine's motion blur. And we can have basically, uh, uh, there's no max distance in the motion blur. We can have motion blur that crosses the screen uh, and look beautiful. It's got a smooth transition into the background. 
So it's gorgeous. It came in very late, so we're still working on it, but uh, it'll be definitely in one of the releases pretty soon. And then another big improvement uh, is a um, way improved depth of field, a brand new technique as well. It gives you a very smooth in and out of the motion blur, and it's a physically controlled motion blur. So if you guys are doing cinematics and you have people used to using real world cameras, then you're setting aperture and you're setting focal distance and you're getting this butter smooth depth of field. So that's it for my part. Uh, James Golding's gonna take over and talk about landscape and foliage. Cool, okay, thank you. So um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the other aspects of the demo that we, we worked on. So here's our overall landscape. So like Francois mentioned, it's about 100 square miles. So it's 10 miles by 10 miles. Um, we, this was originally sort of exported out of World Machine, which is a sort of well-known package for, for building environments, uh, and brought into the engine, but then we could work on it in our own sort of landscape tools in engine. Um, we didn't want to bring in the whole thing as one, you know, you didn't want the whole landscape loaded as one time, so we break it up into what we call streaming levels as well, and so we only load in the area of the world in any detail that's, that's near you. So we need an LOD system to render all that, so those distant areas that we're not loading, uh, they're the blue bits in this screenshot. Uh, for those, we automatically generate a sort of LOD mesh version, that includes any of the meshes that are placed, any foliage and all that kind of stuff. So that's what we use for out in the distance where we're not loading the actual information, but when you get close, uh, that's where you see this colored mesh. So the white is the very high polygon density, and then we sort of gradually fade stuff out. So this has been done for a while. Um, this screenshot, which looks like something from the end sequence of 2001, is actually um, showing the different weight maps that come into the engine. So this is, uh, some of these are exported from World Machine. Um, some of them are, can then be painted by artists manually if they want a particular effect in a particular area. Um, so this is really just the input, though, to what we use to, to shade the landscape. Um, the artists can then build a pretty complicated material that takes these as an input, but can also look at the uh, pixel position and the normal to blend different things together. Uh, and what you end up with is something like this. So this is using all those different masks to, to put rocks in some areas, grass in some areas, really blend together lots of different um, types of landscape in, in quite sophisticated ways. So this is one of those weight maps up close. As you can see, it's pretty low res, but this gets used, if you just use this straight up to blend together some different textures, uh, you just get something like this, which doesn't look great. You've kind of got grass cutting through rocks. So giving the artist control, it means that they can use like a height map effectively to get this. So it sort of biases the way that you blend the things together so you get the, rock, the, the grass coming in between the rocks. It looks much more natural. So that gives you the basic kind of shape of the landscape, but we needed to sort of add the, the you know, other natural elements to it. So we broke this into two tasks, foliage and grass. Foliage is the big stuff, like trees and rocks. Um, it normally has collision on it. Uh, and so this can even be placed manually, you know, one tree at a time, um, or we actually built some procedural placement tools for this, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, grass is um, the smaller stuff, so grass, flowers, pebbles, that kind of thing, normally doesn't have collision. Um, for those things, we used a material-driven approach for placing it, which again, I'll talk about in just a sec. So although we sort of saw these as two slightly different systems, we used the same rendering tech for those. This is something else that we did for this demo, and again, it's part of the engine now. Um, and that's something called a hierarchical instant static mesh component, which is a bit of a mouthful, but the cool thing about it is basically it lets us render millions of instances of things, which is something we wanted when we were you know, rendering very large um, areas. Um, we do this by building kind of a BSP tree structure so we can easily cull out large sections of it. Um, and the other thing that it gives us as a feature is um, per pixel LOD transitions, which I'll show you in this one. Uh, so these are basically the four LODs for our trees. This is one of the shots in the video. So the very lowest one is this 32 poly um, billboard, basically. And then um, the different LODs, the, the numbers at the bottom are the, the poly counts. So it's of 2,500, 13,000. Um, and then we have a hero tree of 115,000 polys. I love the phrase hero tree. Uh, and you'll see that in a minute when we get really close. So as you can see, the transition's happening per pixel. We don't leave trees stuck between um, LODs. We always like go to one or the other. And there's some randomness as well in the transition. So you kind of, it breaks it up a bit. So there's the hero tree. Another thing we did to try and make our LODs look better, um, these are the billboard, the blue ones you saw just now, so just like 32 polys. Um, you can see the one on the left doesn't look that good. It's kind of got these black blotches on, and what's happening there is um, it's shadowing as a, you know, even though it's a picture of a tree, it's shadowing as a sheet. It's casting a shadow as a sheet and receiving it as such. But what our artists were able to do is tweak the material on the billboard so it actually uh, has the depth information on it. So the, the, the one on the right is still a billboard, but it actually sort of modifies the depth that's, that, that the renderer thinks that pixel's at so that the shadow can be received with, you know, like a real tree. So you can see it really improved the quality of our, of our LODs. 
So now we could uh, render quite a lot of foliage. We needed to fill our world with it. So we started looking at some different techniques um, to, to improve the way that we can sort of place foliage in the world. So this is a, a photo from Scotland on the right. Um, we wanted a technique that would give us that kind of natural look where you see clustering of, of trees and, and different vegetation. Um, we wanted it to be self-thinning, which basically means you don't get too much of one species in one place. Um, we wanted there to be natural growth curves, so you saw like, some tall trees, some small trees that look natural. We also wanted it to be quick to iterate on, uh, and that artists could go in and make tweaks to it, so they would be able to use it for you know, all of the demo and, and, and modify things. So we did some research on this, and we came up with this sort of ecosystem uh, procedural foliage idea. The basic idea is it sort of tries to simulate nature. So you set up an ecosystem, and you specify what species are going to take part in that ecosystem. Um, and then you start running the simulation. So to begin with, based on these density parameters, it puts down a few trees you can kind of just about see in the front there, just sort of random placement based on density. And then we start stepping the simulation forward. So the trees start to get older, they get taller, and they spread seeds to nearby areas. Um, so this system doesn't just place trees, it can also place rocks and so forth. It keeps on spreading. And then once the trees start to compete for area, we use a, a sort of fitness function, a set of rules to determine which one is the best fit for that area. And so that can be things like which is the bigger plant, um, do I like shade or not? What's the altitude? What's the slope? The cool thing about this is you get this sort of dependent foliage where certain species only grow in wooded areas. So like the trees grow up and then you start to see shrubs and flowers that only occur in woodlands. So you get this kind of natural relationship between the different things. And that's the sort of final result of running it. Um, you get quite a nice wooded environment. So we use this for um, a lot of the, the stuff, pretty much all the, the foliage you see in the demo. But what we did find, the, the simulation approach was cool. It gave us really nice results, but it takes quite a while to run, particularly on 100 square miles of, of level. Um, so you know, that wasn't great for, for iteration. So what we came up with is this kind of an optimization where um, we compute just 2D tiles, not the whole world, but just like one region or a few sort of samples of regions. And then we apply those 2D tiles. You know, we, we mix them up so you don't see the tiling going on. Um, and we reuse those same rules of like where do trees like to be to sort of prevent trees on steep slopes or places they don't want to be. But it allowed us to get that nice sort of emergent um, uh, approach where they could tweak parameters and see what it was doing, but also very quickly apply it to the whole world. Obviously, in this screenshot, we've applied it to the whole world. We normally don't want to do that. So we let the designers put down volumes, which acts basically as masks. So you can see on the left, we've, we've masked out the area and said, OK, we want this ecosystem here, but on the right, we don't want it. So they could go through and sort of specify what, what happens where. The cool thing about our sim stuff was it also is very deterministic. So once it's happened, the artist can go in and use our regular sort of landscape painting tools to remove and re-add um, foliage in particular places. So we basically use this for all of our sort of cinematic shots. Um, you may have seen the cinematic already. If not, I'm sure it'll be circulating soon. But there's the shots of like the, the boy running through woods. And you know, that was set up by the procedural tool. And they could go in and, and tweak it to look just right, but not have to do the bulk of the work. So I've got, I'm going to show some of the footage from the video we showed earlier. Um, just to sort of highlight, now we've talked a little bit about how we place things. You can see the grass on the ground, the little pebbles on the ground through the, through the grass system, which I'll talk about in just a sec. But then, you know, you've got these, big, these lovely tree meshes from the photogrammetry that are being placed. Um, and they could come up with all different sort of ecosystems, sort of hero ecosystems for just like odd trees on hilltops versus, you know, denser forests and stuff. So the final sort of tally on our, on our level was um, these were placed through the foliage system. So this isn't the grass system we talked about. This is just our sort of um, simulation foliage system. So you know, um, almost 200,000 rocks, over 200,000 trees. And then we've got millions of bushes and got clumps of flowers and big lumps of grass and stuff. So um, you know, we can really make a world that feels pretty, pretty lush. It was cool. So I was talking about grass placement. So this is the foliage stuff. Now we're talking about how we place the little stuff, like the grass. Um, originally, we tried using those white, white maps, the, the colored stuff you saw earlier on, where they could just paint on areas and it would put grass there. But like I mentioned earlier, we tend to use those white maps as an input to the, the final result. And we use other parameters like the slope and the normal and things to, to do more sophisticated blending. So they didn't really match up, and it didn't look great. So what we did instead was we allowed the actual material. This is on the right, one of our node-based materials that was used to, to actually apply to the landscape. But there's a section down in the bottom right, the green box, which is um, where grass should be applied. So we can use the same kind of masks and parameters to choose where the, the foliage goes. Um, and then on the CPU, we basically evaluate that ahead of time to figure out where we need to put all those instances of grass. And, and this worked really well. This is a picture of um, close to the ground, and you can see there's um, heather and grass and so forth. And as we zoom back, that stuff starts to be dilled out and disappear, but it matches perfectly the underlying texture on the landscape. So um, it's a much more natural transition. You don't see it, it visually change too much. So that's the end of the, um, 
sort of landscape and foliage stuff, I'm going to talk a little bit about the deer we saw earlier on I was harassing. Um, we wanted to, uh, you know, we had this world that looked really pretty now. We had a lot of landscape. We had, you know, all these beautiful assets. But we wanted to add some life to it just to stop it from being so sterile. So um, we decided to put some deer in. That's sort of an iconic thing about Scotland, uh, these red deer. Um, and we didn't want to just like animate them and have them going around. So one thing that was also good about this is we, part of this demo was not just about making something pretty. It was about us learning how our systems scale to really large environments and really pushing us to, to build something that we hadn't really built before. Um, and so you know, the, the way we did the deer was using our sort of normal character pipeline. I mean, it sounds silly with deer, but you know, the way that we do movement, the way that we do animation and AI um, is the same for deer as we would use in a, in a shooter or any other kind of game. But it was a good way of us exploring doing that kind of thing in a very large environment. And there were some interesting, unique challenges, and I'll talk a little bit about those. So the basic AI for the deer was uh, take the herd, take the center of the herd. Um, when your camera gets close, uh, find a point that's you know, in the opposite direction from the camera, try and run there, but use pathfinding to get there. So you don't jump off cliffs or try and climb cliffs or you know, um, do something really stupid. They sometimes do things that are stupid, but they, they try. So as well as the basic sort of navigation, we use crowd simulation um, so that the deer can avoid each other and so that they can avoid small obstacles like trees. Um, we hadn't actually done four-legged creatures before very much, and there were a couple of challenges sort of unique to that, like um, make, getting them to turn on the spot can, can look pretty silly. They sort of have to go in in a sort of a curve, um, and it takes them a bit of time to get up to speed, a bit more than, than humans. So that was kind of an interesting learning experience. Um, like I mentioned, we need this navigation data so that they can actually get from point A to point B and, and take a, a sensible route there. What you're seeing in the screenshot, that green, is the navigation data that we have for the world um, to allow them to avoid obstacles. Another nice thing about having this navigation data is we added, just recently, um, a movement mode that uses that navigation data. So it's much cheaper than our normal kind of, you know, doing collision tests to figure out where I can move to. They can basically just like skate around on that, that navigation mesh. So the way our deer work is that um, when they're close to you, they're using our sort of expensive collision-based movement. But as they get further away, they use this navigation mesh movement. So it supports a lot more dynamic creatures in a world, which is cool. Um, the problem with the navigation data is if we tried to pre-calculate it for the whole world, it would be you know, over five gigs of data. So that wasn't going to work. Um, so we added a new feature to the engine, which allows us to generate small tiles in, on demand. So as the deer move through the world, we're basically generating it on, uh, on a, across multiple cores in the background um, and have a video that shows that. So you can see the deer move around, and as they get close to an area where they haven't uh, built the data, you can see the yellow tiles popping up. That's them being worked on. Uh, and they navigate around the trees and so forth. So this is a great feature if you're building a very large environment that you can you know, do this sort of thing on the fly. So for the animation side of things, uh, we use blended root motion, which is kind of a new feature in the engine. Uh, rather than our sort of traditional, we decide where something goes and then animation has to follow. This is you know, um, the other way of doing it where um, the animation drives everything. Uh, so the AI basically gives the deer a goal, like I want to run that way. And then it's the animation system that has to figure out which animation to play. So we use a state machine for that. This is a screenshot of the state machine that we set up. So you can see there's kind of like an idle state. Um, and then various rules decide, OK, I'm going to play a Bolt 180 animation or a Bolt 90 animation, and then go into a running thing. Um, so it, it gave us some, uh, some pretty nice uh, looking, looking movement. Um, we had to do a fair bit of optimization. Well, a bit of optimization as well um, to support a large number of things. In the end, we didn't actually use as many as we could because it looked silly to have hundreds and hundreds of deer. Um, that's just not what you see in Scotland. Um, but this is one of, the, one of our test maps where we were just like testing perf. So we did things like we made better use of multi-threading so that all the animation work and decompression and stuff and blending is happening across multiple threads. Um, we optimized our state machines. Um, so there's like 300 there, um, and we can do a lot more just with, with animation, but that was, uh, that was a, a good sort of exercise for us to, to go through of like, you know, dealing with a lot more dynamic entities than we you know, have traditionally done. Uh, and the last thing I'll talk about is um, we want to actually spawn these things in the world. So we just came up with this fairly si simple system that worked pretty well where um, we divide the world into cells about 300 meters square. And then for each cell, we, we have rules that indicate where things like to be. So deer like forests. So there's a forest in the cell. They'll go there. They sort of walk downhill to find sort of valleys. They tend to like that. The, the crows that you saw use the same system, but they have like different sets of rules of where they like to, to spawn. So that way, as you, as you move around in the world, they just spawn dynamically. So that worked good. So that sort of covers the sort of open world aspect of things. Um, you know, we've talked about lighting, the landscape stuff, foliage stuff. Um, 
as I mentioned before, we broke the world up into these like streaming sections. So as you move through the level, we're loading stuff in, and that's another area we've been working to improve in the engine, improve performance on, and make sure that that stuff works really well. And so this was a really good test case for us on that. Um, and then just general like character performance in terms of animation and things. Um, so I'm going to finish now. I'm going to pass it over to Chris, who's going to talk a bit more about the more uh, cinematic aspect. Hey, guys. All right. Well, James Francois uh, did a really great job kind of talking about the focus on giving, giving everyone the tools and features needed to kind of make really large, open, complex worlds. Um, Earlier, earlier today, Tim was talking about storytelling and kind of our dedication to storytelling. And um, I'm, they asked me to come up just to talk about one key aspect of storytelling, which is kind of cinematic characters. Um, so when we set out um, to work on the demo, we knew that we wanted to show off some of the really great new features and tools uh, for open world um, experiences. How are we gonna do that? <laughs> you know, so um, usually we wanna get together and make some kind of demo. Um, we decided that we were going to showcase that by telling a story, which we've now released um, publicly available so you can watch. And later, uh, it'll be a demo that you can download, look at all the assets, check it out, just like all the, all the content we usually release. Um, so we kind of settled on a character's journey. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, in, in the early days, uh, Gavin, the director, he came up with the idea of a kid that kind of loses something. Um, and then he goes through this, this big open world, and then when he finds it later, he decides that he wants to set that free, because that's kind of what we've been messaging at the conference. I mean, the engine, we're setting it free. Um, I would also say that Gavin kind of helped out mar our marketing department a little bit there, um, because that was the message, and that was the message that we went with. Um, in, in his original boards, you can see here, um, you had some, some gags, like when he's trying to jump up and catch the kite, some, some close-ups of the face. We knew that we were gonna have a character that we wanted to have facial performance on. These are some, some of the early uh, animatics and boards of him when he was climbing over the rock face that you saw earlier in the demo. So from the concept stage to, to final, um, it was about five or six weeks uh, from the actual concepts to the animators having the puppet in hand. We worked with our uh, partners, Three Lateral, um, and they really cranked out. They worked with the art director, with Gavin, with Chris Perna, every step of the way. And one thing you'll notice is, you know, Tim pointed out earlier, the, the curious lack of any robots or lasers or anything like that. I mean, yes, this is a, an, an Unreal demo, but we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, we'll, we'll step outside of our comfort zone a little bit and we'll, we'll make something and, and we want to make sure that the engine is, it performs the best, whether, you know, it doesn't matter what story you want to tell or what your, your art style is. We just wanted to kind of step out of our box and prove, prove some things out. And I think um, from what you've seen, I, th I think the guys, I think we're doing a fantastic job. When it came to the, when it came to the kid himself, we really uh, focused on the face much earlier than the body. Um, we wanted to make sure that no matter what the, the performance was required, that the kid would be able to, to meet that, that standard. So you can see here, even though the body we're still sketching out, we're really, um, you know, Gavin and, and Chris were really focusing on, on the face itself. So when we talk about cinematic fidelity, um, you know, what is, what is cinematic fidelity? I mean, everybody nowadays is talking about film, is talking about cinema, but we're, we're, we, you know, we make stuff that's rendered real time. So cinematic fidelity for us, it's just, um, I mean, everybody has seen iconic characters kind of play out their stories uh, in Unreal Engine games. Um, you know, whether, whether you're on mobile, whether you're on console, whether you're on high-end PC, or whether you're, you want to make a feature film, uh, we, we want to make sure that the pipeline is there to support extremely high fidelity assets. So here you can see some of the, um, <laughs> I think we spent like days just talking about what the kid's hair was gonna look like, but it was really important to us that, that we can handle um, extremely high fidelity cinematic assets. Uh, here, I'll, I'll talk about some of the, some of the technology behind that. Um, with, with the kid's face, uh, he has just a feature film facial rig, um, just, I mean, that's a bit of a overstatement, <laughs> but, uh, I, I want to stress that there's not a, a large uh, multi-hierarchy of joints for a game engine with joint logic driving and things like that. Um, this, is, this is a fax rig with about over 500 blend shapes that, um, that are blending in engine in real time across maybe eight different facial meshes, uh, whether it's the eyelashes, the eyebrows. Um, we also have corrective shapes on the kid's body. So as an animator or as a rigger, 
you, you want to make sure that when you make a pose, you can artistically direct that pose. And it, it's very important to us that the, you know, the engine can support the ability to artistically direct your characters in any of the scenes. Um, again, as I said, from, from mobile all the way through uh, you know, rendering a, a feature or a television show. Uh, Francois already talked about some of the skin shading stuff, so I'll just uh, go over that. Um, when it comes to talking about character technology and high fidelity characters, what, what's a high fidelity character? Um, you, you know, Lena and a lot, of the, a lot of the engineers have just been focusing on really leaning down the process, working on performance, making sure that very high fidelity characters can run in the engine. Um, Tim mentioned the, the, the Thief in the Shadows demo earlier, the, the smog demo, and um, you know, if, if you go and check it out at the booth, I mean, he has 400,000 deforming vertices. I mean, I've never seen a character that high fidelity in, in a real-time engine. So you, you should really take a, take a minute, swing by the booth, check the stuff out. Um, here I have some other, some other facial shots of, of the kid. And um, the animatic shot that I showed earlier, um, I can go ahead and show the final video of that. Nope. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I did it. So here we go. Shift F5. And then click with a the mouse. Boom. Anyway, so that's the same shot that you saw from earlier. And then I was just going to end by saying that, um, you know, Tim said it earlier, we're dedicated to people telling stories in the engine. And the, the, there's no royalties that apply. Completely free for all linear use for, you know, film, television. We really want to empower like a kind of new wave of storytellers to, to use real-time technology and embrace that because that's, that's the way we see things going in the future. We actually have some time for questions. So if you have any questions, um, just let us know. And there's no mics out there, so you can yell really loud. And I just want to thank everybody. Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, a lot of the features that we've been talking about here, um, absolutely, they're going to be part of the engine. I mean, the, the point of doing this is to is to improve the engine and, and get those things in there. So um, yeah, we're actually we're definitely going to be getting those things out. Um, probably 4.8. Um, they did not all hit 4.7, um, but 4.8 is going to have a lot of this stuff in it. A lot of the GI, all of the foliage and stuff. So another question. Yeah. Sure. So, so the question was um, doing urban environments. Um, we've done some interesting stuff in the past with uh, like shape grammars for procedural buildings and things. That's something that I've, I've been interested in. I've talked to GDC before on that. Um, I'm hoping that like the blueprint stuff, the way we sort of can build procedural, um, uh, the way that we can build procedural stuff uh, using blueprints is, is one interesting avenue there. I think we need to give a few more different tools. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think there's some interesting stuff you could do there with the sort of basis that we already have in there. So, yeah? What do you have in mind for a streamlining official emission used for phoning or lip syncing? Sure, so the question was about um, sort of phoneme extraction type facial animation. Um, we don't have any like firm plans right now, but there's definitely conversations about that stuff. I think that hopefully that's something we can hit this year. Um, it, there's some questions there about how we can, how we can deal with it. I mean, there, there is middleware that will integrate with the engine, like face effects and stuff that you can use for that stuff right now. Um, I know I think they're at the show, uh, but it's something that yeah we're, we're definitely thinking about, but we haven't sort of finalized plans on that yet. So, another question? Um, it's not deterministic. Uh, it's one of the things about doing the blended root motion that we use is that's pretty hard to. Um, there's a bit more state to network there, um, so we knew that it was a single player demo, so that's why it was sort of appropriate for that. Uh, I mean, you could do it, but there'd be a little bit more work involved to get that to work. Uh, question right here. That's probably a Francois question. I'm sorry? <laughs> so the question was, uh, how long did it take us to sort of build this whole thing, and what did we do to try and improve, like, 
Yeah. So it was it was a, a process that started kind of had a, its own first idea. I guess it was in I would say October. Uh, I only went to capture some of our assets at the end of December, right before Christmas. So. I'd say that most of it came together in January and the end of February. So it was actually a very short time frame, um, which made it quite challenging. There's still stuff we'd like to add, as always. But uh, yeah, so it was a pretty, pretty tight um, amount of time to create this. The team at the most was about, I think, 13 people towards the end. So the tools were pretty. Uh, they, they, they scaled pretty well and they helped us achieve a lot more than we could uh, normally with a small team. Sorry, a multiplayer? I mean, that, that should just work fairly seamlessly. I mean, this is, um, the size of this world is, you know, is, is something that we can still handle in a, in a multiplayer environment. So, um, you know, you, there might be some questions about how you deal with the streaming implications of that. Um, but, you know, absolutely, there should be no reason that you could, you could totally build this into a multiplayer environment. There, there's, there's no big, big problems there. Yeah, you probably, you probably want to load all the, all the levels, all the geometry on the server, so you probably need a bit of memory on the server to do that. Um, but you wouldn't need the, the graphics stuff if it was a dedicated server. So, um, the question over here? Um, no, the question was about floating point precision. Um, no, we didn't. Uh, we've sort of found with some experiments that um, this is about the kind of uh, you know, size that we can kind of get to without too many issues. So um, you know, we have char the character can walk around at the edges of the world without too much problem. Um, we've been working on sort of making that more robust for, for this reason. Um, there were some issues with um, some of the rendering stuff and like texture resolution th things, I think, uh, which were resolved. So there's been a few fixes, I think, to handle some issues at the edges and some like workflow improvements. But. Oh yeah, and, and the way the animation worked was it was like figuring out the bones in world space, and so we, fi we sort of fixed the order of multiplies. To, so there are a few fixes to deal with animations a long way from the origin. Um, but again, that, that's why we do stuff like this. It's not just to make a pretty result. Um, we've tried to pick things that push the engine in a direction that we see people want us to go, and you know we have to really you know solve those problems. Question over here. Yeah. Um, that, it's all world space, um, so we don't have any um, sort of block and offset type stuff. It's just like one large coordinate system. I can talk about just, just real oh. quick. Uh, I should also mention that, as you know, with a world this big, um, DCC tools can't even handle it. So yes, we had floating point precision, you know, issues in Maya and stuff. So we, we would have a localized scene route in the engine, and that would allow the animators to go ahead and back transform closer to the origin in their DCC animation package. Because as you know, I mean, you're, you're not going to be doing like space flight in Maya. It's you know, um, but but yeah, so it, we, we would make a cinematic uh, scene route um, and go and use that to go back and forth between matinee um, to allow everything to kind of sync up nicely with cameras and the kid and everything for the cinematic anyway. It's, it's a question that we've talked about a lot. Um, we know there are some people who want to build worlds even bigger than this and support multiplayer. And we have origin shifting. So if you're making a single player game, um, you can, like, as you move, we can move the whole world back to keep you near the origin. Um, beyond that, it's tricky. We'd like to do it, but the, you need to have some different way to, we can maybe talk offline, but um, there are some pretty significant implications for like, the whole game API. You'd have to not stop using vectors to represent world positions. And that has a, that, yeah, it's figuring out the, the trade offs there, which are hard. So. Uh, another question here? Francois? Um, we're, we're actually for, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, we have the displacement maps. Actually, initially, we're going to do the rocks entirely as vector displacement, which is what our, our goal was initially. So we basically have a box and just run a vector displacement map and recreate these rocks that we could hold out. So in the end, we didn't use inner vector displacement. There's not even tessellation on the rocks. Uh, but we have the maps for it. That, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we have like a kind of a proprietary process that we set up for that. Uh, but yes, uh, our goal is hopefully we'll get that tech. Uh, so right now it's just normal maps and meshes and geometry, yeah. Yeah. Yes? Yes. 
they got to pay for our plane tickets. <laughs> yeah, so we, we're going to definitely put them together and be on the... Um, um, there's some cool stuff that's going to that's gonna come out regarding that stuff, so keep an eye out, and, uh, and uh, we'll announce some stuff shortly. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um, so we're using a light function for the cloud, so they're not volumetric. It's definitely something that we want to do, and we've talked about. Um, and so, so it's a skybox and a, a uh, so a material function that has like a cut out, a procedural cut out of the clouds. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, we're out of time. So we are happy to take questions outside if you guys have more. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>